I am very pleased to welcome Sanchia Alessia, the Mayor of Barking and Dagenham. Sanchia is an award-winning specialist in equality and diversity and human resources, and she was first elected to the council in 2010. She's held a number of positions, school governor, chair of health and adult services scrutiny committee, and chair of the planning committee. She also works at Brunel University as their equality, diversity, and inclusion manager. And it's interesting to note that in, 2013, in 2010, when Sanchi was first elected, she became the youngest woman on the council and with her colleagues achieved a 7% labour swing from the British National Party as they had reached out to the wider community. So numerous assets that you bring to the conversation. We're very pleased to have you with us. I've also got here Chloe Chambreau, Gender Equality Director at Business in the Community. Chloe is... Uh, the Gender Equality Director for Business in the Community, the Prince's Responsible Business Network. She is responsible for leading key research projects on gender equality in the workplace and engages in high-level consultations with key business leaders and policymakers to drive change for women and men at work. Last year, she managed Same But Different, which some of you may have heard about, a groundbreaking photography exhibition which illustrated the concept of intersectionality and shone a light on the diversity of women at the work. This year, she will lead on Equal Lives, a project that aims to support men with their caring responsibilities at home to unleash the potential of women at work. Prior to this role, Chloe worked on programs to prevent violence against women at girls with the United Nations in Fiji and created a social enterprise for survivors of violence in a local NGO in Thailand. So it's wonderful to have you with us. Thank you very much, Chloe. And last but by no means least, I'm very pleased to have Claudia Aiton, Diversity and Talent Management Specialist. And Claudia is a human resources consultant and coach in the area of talent management, diversity and inclusion. She has had an extensive corporate career with more than 25 years at Unilever in local, regional and global HR roles up to senior director level. She sits on the Board of Governors at Portsmouth University as a non-exec and is also chair of their HR committee. So it's brilliant to have you with us. Claudia, and I said last but not least, uh, but actually we have one more contribution and we're going to start with him. It's Dr. Jay Stewart and you can't see him here because he is going to be speaking to us through a video that he recorded specially for this session. And Jay has been involved in the trans community since 2002 and delivered his first arts-based project called Identity: What's the Science of Sex and Gender for Young Trans People in 2004? Since then, he's been passionate about improving the lives of trans and gender questioning people, especially young people, and is keen to increase opportunities for trans voices to be heard in all their diversity, intelligence and richness. In 2008, he co-founded Gendered Intelligence alongside Dr. Catherine McNamara and now oversees the main activities across the organization. And Gendered Intelligence, for those of you who don't know it, is a community interest company established in 2008 that provides activity, support, training, and resources for the trans community, and particularly specializes in supporting young trans people aged between eight and 30. Uh, and Jay was awarded an MBE in 2014 on the New Year's Honors list for his services to the trans community. So we will now hear from Dr. Jay Stewart. Hello, my name is Jay Stewart and I am the Chief Exec of an organisation called Gender Intelligence. Um, I'm really sorry I can't be there today. I've been asked to do a short uh, video presentation just to let you look, know a little bit about the organisation and to maybe offer some thoughts around um, what we think of as trans-inclusive practices. Okay, so we uh, are a community interest company. We established ourselves in 2008. So we are 10 years old this year. Um, our vision is of a world where people are no longer constrained by narrow perceptions of gender, where gender diversity is visible and valued in society. So really, <coughs> excuse me, we are an organization um, that is interested in um, getting people to think about gender in more rich, nuanced and diverse ways, to celebrate gender in all of its diversity and to open up opportunities for everybody to express the gender that feels right for them. We're a trans-led organisation. I'm a trans person myself. I was assigned female at birth and identify as a trans man or a trans masculine person. And we think that actually trans people have got a lot to offer this discussion and debate. 
Um, and it's through our lived experiences as trans people where we feel we can um, really um, throw a lens or cast a, an idea around the ways in which gender um, and the binary of gender and this sort of stereotypical thinking around gender can really restrict and restrain people in everyday life. Um, we do a range of different things. We work with uh, young people, young trans or gender questioning people from the ages of eight right through to the ages of 30. We've been offering a bit more focus around 18 to 30 age groups because we feel that there's, um, there, that there's an age there that, that may benefit from more support. In general terms, I would say that there's a, um, a lack of uh, confidence around uh, young professional trans people coming into the workplace and gendered intelligence wants to play its part in thinking with organisations across the commercial sector, the public sector and the third sector about what trans inclusion might look like for staff but also for customers as well. Um, so I thought I might just offer a bit of a broad brushstroke around um, what we think trans inclusive practices look like or what a trans inclusive environment, environment might look like. Um, we have got a membership scheme and in that membership scheme we try to carve out um, the different areas where an organisation can lend some focus to. So I guess we're thinking about trans people as customers and so what can an organisation do to improve customer services? Um, what can an organisation do to think about employee satisfaction? But also what are organisations doing to widen the recruitment talent pool and including trans people into the organisation from the offset? One of the things that we think is really important uh, for all organisations is to think about uh, policy and procedures. We are noticing more organisations approaching us, looking for support around policy writing, guidance writing, so that when a someone comes out as trans and wants to transition in the workplace, that they feel happy and supported and that line managers can feel confident around what that support looks like. And also HR teams can have uh, expertise and knowledge around uh, ensuring that there's compliance there. So we can't, has, can't kind of emphasize enough um, the importance of policy uh, writing really. We, we see lots of individual professional people coming to us really um, keen and passionate about trans inclusion um, but it may be that when they leave all of the good work kind of goes with them. So for me policy is incredibly important um, because it, it, it retains the trans inclusive practice, the trans inclusive kind of uh, agenda if you like within the organisation. The second thing that we look at within our membership scheme is monitoring and recording. So that's asking the question around how are you monitoring trans identities but also gender more broadly. Are you asking the right questions? Are you uh, allowing people to um, tick the box that best describes them? Or is your, are your options really quite binary uh, in that sense? Where is that data being held? Is it confidential? Is it safe? Do people have confidence in your monitoring and recording? The third thing is really around review and improvement. So I would say, what does feedback look like from trans customers, from trans members of staff? Um, how are you looking and reviewing uh, based on that feedback? And what are your measures that you're putting in place to improve that? Because there's always uh, work to do. What are your facilities like? So when a trans person comes into the building, um, are there gender neutral toilets? Where is the, um, you know, where are the, where is the, trans inclusive practices around not making any assumptions of anyone's gender coming through a building. Um, so we look at that as well, so, sort of people's environments, the everyday life that people um, have navigating buildings. 
Uh, the fifth thing is around visibility and really are there trans people in the organisation? Are they visible? Are they um, happy to um, to be counted, to stand up and be counted? If not, why not? Um, Often invisibility is there because people want to protect themselves and they're worried potentially that they might be treated differently as a result of coming out as trans. So where is the visibility piece around trans experiences and also around diverse gender identities and diverse gender expressions? And the final thing is really about um, our practices. Do our professionals, our colleagues in the workplace have good awareness, confidence and understandings of trans experiences because for me it does feel that people lack confidence and are really looking for support around that. So, so that's it, so that's it. Um, those are my um, headlines. I hope you enjoy your day and I look forward to hearing how it went. Thank you. Thank you very much to Jay, even though he can't hear our thanks. Um, it's very thoughtful of him to send that in. And Claudia, I'd like to come to you next because I know you've got some thoughts that you wanted to set out at the outset as well. Thank you, Afra. I put some of my thoughts down just as a run into the conversation. Um, everyone can hear me. I think I can hear myself on the mic. When you look at me, do you see a black woman in a black and white dress? Or do you see, do you look closer and see someone who has a rich life experience? Someone who's had extremes of joy and pain, who's traveled far, and who might have a point of view and something to say? Or do you see me at all? To understand what's happening with diversity and, and equality through inclusion in the workplace, I focus specifically on ethnicity, which doesn't, which doesn't mean that the other strands of diversity aren't significant or important. They're just the lens with which I'm coming to this conversation. And a few things stand out with that focus. There is good news overall in terms of education, we heard that earlier this morning, and that the proportion of graduates has increased across all sectors of the community. But interestingly, it's increased more within ethnic minority groups, and they now have higher levels of educational attainment than what their white working age peers. While the BAME population represents 13% of the population today, it's estimated that one in four school children are of a BAME background. So the demographics are changing, but are we? Ambition is certainly not lacking. In the McGregor Smith report run earlier this year, 70% of BAME respondents claim career progression is important to them, versus 42% of their white counterparts. But 52% of them believe they will have to leave their current organization in order to achieve it. Even though they're less likely to be hired than their white counterparts with equivalent qualifications and will earn less than them with the gap widening as their careers progress. An interesting statistic is that today a black male graduate earns on average 17% less than his similarly qualified white counterpart that intersection of gender and ethnicity is the shows the widest differential between the white male group and any other. This is, this is coming or taken from the Resolution Foundation's research, which is an interesting piece of work. And all this is taking place in a context where the proportion of managers across the workforce who have a performance objective to promote equality and diversity is down by more than 20% in the last three years, now stands at one in three. In 2017, the McGregor Smith report identified six areas of activity to increase diversity and equality in the workforce. One year later, the report shows that they've made small progress in one area, four areas are flat, and the other one is distinctly worse. They also put an economic value on this equality and diversity and calculate that the full benefit to the UK economy from proper representation of BAME individuals across the labour market through improved participation and progression 
is likely to be of the order of 24 billion pounds a year, or 1.3% of GDP. So why are we here? I think we all in this room understand and accept that unconscious bias is a necessary part of the human condition. At a very basic level, it keeps us safe. We've learned to recognize danger in an instant, and from very quick signals, we draw life-saving conclusions. The sound of an oncoming car stops us from stepping into the street. We don't need to think about it. But we also make judgments about people in an instant, on all aspects of physical appearance, and very significantly here in the UK, on accents. The criteria for what is acceptable and or aspirational are set early, very early on, from family norms and traditions and the huge influence of the mass media. Prior to 2018, Hollywood moguls didn't believe that stories of black lives or having black characters in lead roles would sell to mainstream America or anywhere else for that matter. And then we had Black Panther. But I digress. The point is that <laughs> subliminal but no less powerful attitudes and biases are struck very early and laid deep. And if they remain unquestioned or unchallenged, they inform everything. If we don't support our mainstream leaders to look past these traditionally aspirational norms of what good looks like and sounds like, through every act of hiring, onboarding, work assignment, progression, assessment, succession planning, promotion, and pay decisions, we're destined to continue as we are. What can we in HR, and I'm speaking to the HR practitioners in the room, do to interrupt this process, to help the hiring manager to get past the name that isn't English sounding, to help the line manager to be comfortable with having a conversation with someone who's not just like him? How can we help them see people and not boxes? Not generic types to which they then ascribe automatic internalized value judgments. How can we get them to be inclusive? When you look at me, what do you see? A black woman in a black and white dress or a person who might have a point of view? Thank you very much, Claudia. Chloe, do you want to make some opening remarks about your thoughts on the subject of yeah. equality and diversity through inclusion? So um, I work for Business in the Community, which is the Prince's Responsible Business Network. And we do a lot of work not just around gender equality. Actually, this is only one of our four workplace mm -hmm. campaigns. Um, so we've got a race campaign, age campaign and well-being, and the gender equality one, which we very much work alongside and in collaboration with each other. Because as you said, it's not just a gender equality issue or just you know, mm. a race issue. Actually, we need to look at the intersection. And um, we produce a lot of research to inform the recommendation and the, the advice we give to our, our members. And just following on what you said, can you hear me properly or is it weird? Yeah? Okay. We've got a little bit of feedback on yes, this. On the yeah. side, um, I'm not sure there's much we can do, but you're well, doing a great I, job I keep, speaking. I keep speaking. So um, basically what you've described in terms of the gender and the race coming together to create a unique um, experience, which sometimes is re resulting in discrimination or um, harder challenges for certain groups, for instance, uh, black women or women with disabilities. This is something that is actually quite difficult sometimes um, for employers to get their head around. Um, and that is the concept of intersectionality. So in order to make it more accessible to employers, but also get employees to understand what it means for others, um, we created the same but different exhibition, which um, I'm going to talk about in, in a minute. And I think for a long time, you know, all the gender equality program focused on women. But actually, when you looked at the women they helped, it was mostly white privileged middle class women. And that's not fair. And that's not diversity and inclusion, in my opinion. So what we did is I interviewed 20 women, and you can find the um, exhibition online at samedifferent.org.uk. We interviewed 20 women from very different backgrounds, trans women, women with disability, and we asked them, tell us about your experience of the workplace. And it was very open-ended. And now this exhibition is touring in the UK, and each of our members can 
um, hosted for free. And it really starts conversation in the workplace about the, the challenges of different identity traits and characteristics coming together, which I think is really important. Otherwise, we only help the, the major, the, 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 a certain number of women, but not, not those who need it most. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is if we want to promote women in workplaces and we want to help them, we kind of need to take a step back and look at the causes of inequality in the workplace. And for a long time, employers have just been, you know, focusing on let's progress women, let's give them mentoring and training and sponsorship and all that, completely disregarding the fact that women have things going on at home. That in this country, we still think, and in the policy, it's still very much women who have to, you know, shoulder sometimes the burden of, of caring um, if you look at the maternity leave policy, etc. So unless we acknowledge that women have things going on outside of work, we're not going to make any progress towards closing the pay gap. So our latest research um, is called Equal Lives, and you can find the report um, outside. And it was very much looking at gender equality as a whole and looking at the way in which men are also suffering from gender norms and stereotypes and that toxic masculinity is not helpful. And this culture of long hours and presenteeism, which has favored men for some years because you know they probably had someone work, stay, staying at home, is not working anymore. And it's not working either for men or women. So um, really the idea with Equal Lives was to find out, do men want to care more? Do they want to challenge us kind of stereotypes and, and patterns? And if so, what employers can do to help them? So we very much looked at the policies because policies are extremely important. But actually, we also asked about the culture. We asked them, what if, the, if, you, what if a senior man did it? Would it help you? What if your peers did it? Would it help you? Taking shared parental leave, taking flexible working. So we looked at the enablers and barriers, both from policy and culture perspective. And I think the two are so interlinked. Mm -hmm. And we found that men want to care more, but they can't. And it's very hard for them to access that in the organization. And I think unless we manage to rebalance this and, and employers can play a huge role, because for me, employers are like small governments in a way. They can make up their own policies and their own rules, and they can change people's lives in a very significant way if they want to. And we've seen it with you know companies like Accenture or Aviva giving men and women the same equal mm. packages for parents. Because you're power and you get the same, which is what Sweden has been doing for many years. Um, that is really having a big impact on people's lives, and that will help women. Thank you very so. much. Um, it's really interesting to hear from both of you and from Jay, because we're hearing from you, Chloe, about the structural reasons why people are not in a position of equality in the workplace, but also, Claudia, how perception and prejudice and some of the historical cultural factors shape our experience as well. And I'm interested to bring you in, Sanchia, to hear about the role of government and what the public mm. sector can do and how somebody like you can help shape this situation. Mm. So, so tell us your thoughts. Thank you. I wanted to, um, I was thinking um, about inclusion and what it meant. Um, and I was thinking about what it meant to me um, and at its simplest form, it's about everybody being included, but it is more complex than that. It's, it's really about people um, being freely and openly accommodated without feeling restricted or limited in being themselves in any way. Um, and so um, I have another hat. I work at Brunel University and I was thinking about the things that the students have done, which I want to touch on to help us as a university actually become more inclusive. Um, and start to embrace um, people irrespective of their background. So as a university, we, we normally think about equal access and opportunity for the students to study. Um, but we're now kind of moving on to how do we eliminate discrimination and remove barriers um, so that students can have equality of outcome. Um, and one of the things that you mentioned was the attainment. Um, at our university, we do still have an attainment gap that is where um, BME students are not necessarily achieving the same grades as their white counterparts when they graduate. So that's still an issue for us that we need to um, tackle. Um, and one of the things that students have been pushing for and our students union have been pushing for to help us as a university become more inclusive is to see a more diverse representation of our staff and particularly at the senior management for the professional staff and professors 
um, at the academic level. Um, and they've, they've also been working on diversifying the curriculum because what we found is that when you kind of analyse our curriculum, even if you look, for example, of reading lists in English literature, I remember you saying you, you, you knew a, a lecture in English literature, the, li the reading lists are full of white male authors. Um, and the students have actually been working with the lecturers to change those reading lists to have more women and have more BME um, authors mm -hmm. and change the way, not just in which we read around the subject, subject, but now we're starting to move into how we teach the subjects as well. Um, and so for us, when our organisation is fully inclusive, what we would like to see is us as an organisation embracing everyone, uh, both staff and students, and that they feel that they belong, they're engaged with us, they're connected, they're respected and they're valued for their contribution. Um, and I think for us, um, a pub, I think public sector and universities have had to do a lot of adapting um, to the changing needs. So if I think about um, where I'm the mayor in Barking and Dagenham, we've had quite a rapid pace of change in terms of population growth and diversity in that. So traditionally it was a, it was a very white area and in a short space of time that's become much more um, diverse. And so for us, we've had to look at community cohesion um, and how we celebrate um, and recognise that there are people of different cultures and backgrounds um, and that we are sort of one borough and one community, but how we get our white residents to actually, it's, it's tricky, but we, we have a theme of no one left behind, um, but actually it's also about them helping them on their journey come to accept that the borough is changing and will continue to change. And so when the British National Party did come into our borough um, a number of years ago, you know, they were talking about the changes that were happening. But actually, the promises that they made to do things around it were unattainable because our borough is going to continue to change. And as an outer London borough, we're going to continue to attract people to live and work there because the costs of living are so much cheaper. And so we've been doing um, a lot of community conversations um, about what the priorities are for us as one community going forward. Um, and so I just wanted to end um, by saying that inclusion should be an active process, which um, involves creativity and thinking outside of the box and understanding that everybody has something to contribute. And even for us, um, listening to people's contributions that, that we may not necessarily agree with, but how do we work with those people to make them feel part of the community? Um, and how do we get people to participate in their community and feel supported. So I look forward to the debate ahead. Thank you Thank very you. much. I think the theme for me coming out from everything that you've all said is that there is diversity that mm -hmm. exists. There are mm -hmm. women in the workplace, mm -hmm. there are minority people in the workplace, pe people of different faiths with disabilities in the workplace and in society, in local areas, in communities. But the question is, how do we create a situation in which people can thrive? Mm. And I want to ask you, mm. Claudia, from an HR perspective, is there a danger that businesses are celebrating the fact they have diversity, but not thinking about what they need to proactively do to create an environment in which people can thrive? And as Sanchez was defining inclusion, be authentic to themselves, not feel pressure to conform to maybe a pre-existing cultural norm. Um, is, is there enough emphasis on doing something to create the right conditions in which people coming in who haven't been represented in that space before can thrive? I think there's not just a danger, but also a potential opportunity missed. There's recent research that shows that you actually have enhanced outcomes when you have a diverse team working together mm. when they're in full flow. You can have productivity and output fall if you have a diverse team that isn't working well together. Mm -hmm. But when you can actually get everyone on song, the performance and the output of that group is substantially higher than either the non-optimized um, diverse team or a homogenous one. So that's been pretty well established for now. But I think organizations are also cottoning on to the fact that as their customer bases change and become more diverse, 
if you think of it globally, there are many more middle class populations emerging in Africa, in the Far East, etc. And they want they want output from a lot of businesses. And the best way to, to achieve and meet those needs is to have those people represented in their thinking and their customs and their understandings within the organization. So it makes sense for business to be able to curate diverse teams and not just put them together in a room, close the door and hope for the best, but actually help them to, to be inclusive because that's when the magic happens not before. And so curating and helping ma line managers to become inclusive managers is not just a nice thing to do, there's business value in it. I'm, I'm thinking, Chloe, when you were talking about the word strategic comes to mind, that actually your work, for example, uh, helping men be able to access their caring needs is, is quite a strategic way of creating mm -hmm. equality. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of the film On the Basis of Sex about the US Supreme Court Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg, mm -hmm. um, which is about to come out, but her landmark gender case when she was a, a young lawyer in America was about she challenged, she couldn't find a way to challenge gender discrimination, which was in thousands of pieces of legislation. Mm -hmm. But she found a man who wanted to care for his mother, his elderly mother, mm -hmm. and the law defined a carer as a woman. Mm -hmm. So she found a male victim of gender discrimination. Mm -hmm. She strategically realized would have more chance of mm -hmm. succeeding in the courts. Mm -hmm. um, but once mm -hmm. they agreed in principle that it was not right to gender a carer to, to assume it was any gender, then they could use that as a precedent for overturning all of the legislation that discriminated against women. Um, do you think that we need, to, is, is, is being strategic important here? And, and, and I'm curious as to whether you've had any backlash against people who don't understand why someone campaigning for gender equality would focus on men. Um, I was expecting it, but we didn't get any. Mm. I was expecting it from the media and the only thing I got is a journalist telling me, well, it's women's choice to, dis you know, to be at home if they want to be at home. And I said to this journalist, I used to work with street sex workers and they said to me, this is my choice to do this work. But then they talked about they would love to be a cleaner in a hotel because that would be better work. So then it made me think about what is a good choice. And a good choice is when you have different high quality options. If you have to choose between care or career, that's not a choice to me. That's not a good choice. It's you have to sacrifice one of the two. So what we're saying is we want to give men and women the same opportunities to realize their potential at home and at work. And as long as they have the same opportunities and decide, actually, I don't want it. I don't want to take paternity leave for four months, full pay. Find me, find me one man who would, who would say no. Um, then that's, that's equality. And then people can make real choices. But if women have to take career breaks, have to work part time, have to work um, under their potential and their skills because of the system we are in that is not working, that's not equality. Do you think that by focusing on employment practices, you can shape wider cultural attitudes? Because in a way, the issues you're dealing with are a reflection of our cultural values yeah, that we yeah. still see childcare as a woman's yeah. job. Mm -hmm. We still overplay the role of mothers and downplay the role of fathers. Can we change that through the employment lens or do we have to get a wider cultural change before those changes start to reflect in the workplace? I mean, ideally, we need the culture change. We need government to you know, enact legislation that really allows for equality. And there is shared parental leave, but it's extremely mm -hmm. complicated. You talk to employers and they say, here's my policy and it's 40 pages. It's very hard to decipher. We can't expect employees to, to access it if it's not accessible. But employers can do so much. And um, I think that's what I find really exciting with working with employers. They can change the rules, but it needs to come with a culture change within the organization. Mm -hmm. So if you look at Accenture, they've got six times the national average in terms of shared parental leave take up. And they have that because they give men and women the exact same pay package when women and men want to go and live and to, to care for their children. But they also have done a lot of work culturally to say, this is okay to take this as a man. And when we did the focus group, what was fascinating for me is to hear men saying, I am a hero in my organization for taking shared parental leave, or I am being ridiculed. And the difference being the culture and what is encouraged or not. And is it all right to make a man a hero? And I'm thinking of mm. when I drop my daughter at school yeah. and whenever there is a dad on the school run, everyone's like, oh, you're mm. so wonderful. <laughs> I never get told I'm wonderful for dropping my daughter at school. And it's great that the dads are there, but it's a big deal and we all yeah. praise them so much for it. 
is, is, is that mm. the right way to go? I mean, I suppose it's yeah. helping incentivize them to do it, but part of me yeah. slightly resents it, if yeah. I'm honest. Mm. I mean, what's really interesting is when you ask men about uh, gender equality in the workplace and the attitudes, most of men think it's fine. Then you say, why don't you take shared parents leave? And they f they're like, oh, well, it might affect my career prospect. And you, mm. you, you say, wait a minute, I thought everything was fine and there was gender equality. <laughs> so, I mean, it's true, we need to shy away from making men as heroes just for doing their job of caring for their children, you know? Uh, that's definitely true. But I think it's also important to encourage alternative models of masculinity in the workplace where it's okay to be a man and care. And we've had really interesting stories in Ecolive's um, focus groups, you know, men leaving coats on their chairs, uh, putting outlook meetings to pretend they were having a, a meeting mm -hmm. when they were going to the nursery. And this still means it's not acceptable to be a dad and be committed in the workplace. We need to ch change that perception. But also talking to same-sex couples, m dads, it was fascinating because you see that they don't inherit gender norms in the way that heterosexual couples do. So they create their own norms and they do it based on preference. And they can do that in a way because there is no assumption from the law that because you're a woman, you're going to get 52 weeks of maternity leave or because you're a man, you're going to get two weeks. So that's fascinating because that helps us think differently as well. And speaking of cultural change, Sancho, mm. I'm fascinated by the the idea of working in a community that did mm. have such an entrenched mm. relationship with the far right mm. and mm. turning it into one where you can talk about inclusion and diversity. Is there, is there an, an, an attitude still that it's a zero sum game, that if you include new entrants from a different ethnic minority, then you're excluding mm. the, the former white working class inhabitants? Or have, have you been able to create an atmosphere of inclusion where everybody has mm. a stake in it? What are the challenges mm. to doing that? Yeah, I mean, so as I said, we've had our community conversations. We've also tried to do fun things. So we have um, Embarking in Dagnum, a summer of festivals, which focuses on different themes, which brings the community together. And we have coffee mornings and coffee afternoons with um, our members of parliament and with the leaders of the council and the councillors so that people can just sit down with a cup of tea and a biscuit and actually sit next to someone that they wouldn't normally talk to and just get to know them as a person um, in their local community, in their street. And we found that as time goes on, um, those have grown in success. It's not to say that there are not still some people that have um, views sometimes when they come out and in the coffee afternoons, you just think, okay, we still got some, some way to go here. But actually the council facilitating bringing people together has helped um, for those particularly um, white residents who have been in the borough for a long time come to accept that the borough has changed and will continue to change. And we've had to help them on that journey, um, but also not um, um, make the new um, uh, migrants to the community, migrants I'm talking about from other boroughs, um, feel stigmatised or feel that they're doing something wrong for being there. Um, and so um, we have been working on that. And I think one of the things that we've also been working on is all the issues that surround when you have new population growth. So infrastructure, you know, jobs, skills, employment. And traditionally, um, our white residents in Barking and Dagenham don't have the educational qualifications. So we've got the lowest amount of people going to university in our borough. Um, and traditionally, that was because we had a huge full plant and that used to employ the whole borough, actually. And now that that's scaled right down, we have to think of how do we skill up um, our existing and residents who don't have qualifications and how do we train apprentices coming through so that they will um, have a bright future going forward. Really interesting. Uh, we could keep talking but um, <laughs> we've only got 10 minutes till lunch and I want to bring you in so uh, are there any questions and could you put your hand right up so that I can get a microphone to you please. Oh yeah lady over there in the grey thank you so much and please don't forget to introduce yourself first. Thank you so much. Hi, um, Jane Fordham. I'm a diversity and talent consultant and a relatively new. Um, I have been doing a lot of work with corporates this year. Not surprisingly, um, a lot of the diversity initiatives seem to be starting with gender. Uh, I think it's a positive place to start and most of them enlightened enough to go, oh, hang on a minute, there's a wider picture here and then it's a ladder up into something more strategic. So that's a positive. But what I am getting a lot of, because we're starting with gender, is the kickback from uh, the other, the, the majority slash minority. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm a, a positive, uh, inclusive person, and I, I tend to swallow the, um, 
you know, the, the, the sort of um, very emotive response to say, well, you know, tough luck, this is how we, the rest of us have been feeling for uh, several millennia. <laughs> but I'd be interested to hear the views of the panel about how we perhaps can turn that debate around because we don't want it to be negative. We want to carry everybody along on the journey. And clearly we want men to be included, to have different choices and to be change agents as well. So, um, yes, interested in your response. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's a great question. Uh, I'd like to say Central. something on that. At, at Brunel University, with my other hat, we've been thinking this year, actually, about how we identify and work with male allies to push our inclusive agenda forward. And so we started working with an organisation this year called the Good Lad Initiative, which works with both men and women, but primarily men, to challenge gender um, stereotypes and help them think about about how helping the cause for gender equality will actually help um, them because actually when we have more inclusive practice and policy it benefits a wider group than women so we've started to delve into that both with the staff and the students and next year we're kind of looking to ramp that up a lot more because what we've seen from starting to look into that is that we do have male allies and we do have people willing to help us um, both male allies and, and um, white um, allies in terms of the BME agenda. We do have people willing to help us push this agenda forward and they have some creative ideas of how we can do that. So I think it's about identifying those allies and working with them. Um, yes, Jane, I recognise the scenario you paint. There's a saying that goes, when you've experienced privilege all your life, equality feels like discrimination. <laughs> so there may be a bit of that going on. But I, I think to come back to Sanchez's comments, in the end, it's going to be about leadership, isn't it? And it's finding the men in the organization who are happy to have a go at creating a more level playing field because of what it will produce not just because it's, a, it's the right thing to do or it's morally just or, or any of those wonderful, laudable reasons, but you need to go beyond that, I, I suggest, in enrolling men in this adventure. It's about, um, I think somebody made the point earlier this morning, it's, it's relatively easy to, to have men join into the conversation when they consider their wives and daughters in terms of the gender debate. The ethnicity debate can be a bit hard, more of a stretch in terms of seeing themselves in the other person's shoes. But beyond that, it's around understanding what the potential for the organization and the wider community is, which can be a bit of a stretch. But again, the, op the organization has the opportunity to reward the right behaviors that start moving in that direction. The thing about the, the McGregor Smith's recommendation to actually make creating an equal, an equal and, and inclusive environment, one of the objectives on which they're remunerated, for instance. So there are steps that you can take to start changing the dynamic. But um, I think fundamentally it's around having the conversations. What we don't want is men to fold their arms and, and say, stay stum in the moment and then, you know, go away and, and, and do their grumbling elsewhere. We want to have a, a lively debate in order to change the way things are now. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Are there any more questions? Yes, uh, lady here at the front and then at the back afterwards. But yes, the lady with the yellow cardigan. Thank you. Um, hi, my name's uh, Izzy Farnell from a charity called Mermaids and we support uh, trans and gender diverse young people. Um, one of the issues facing trans young people is that they um, often lack formal education um, and formal qualifications. And really it's how can we as leaders um, make a more inclusive workspace for people who, who haven't gone to university. We've, there's been a lot of talk today about how people are disadvantaged through university, but then have been through that. And I think that we are also mass missing a gap of the, of the, of people who should be in work who are sort of lacking that formal education so how can we be more inclusive to those groups thank you very much that's a great question yes Chloe. Um, we've got a, a campaign called uh, future proof your business which was looking at basically how businesses talk about the jobs and, and the kind of jargon that they are in mm -hmm. the jobs such as the kpis and all these difficult um you know, terms for someone who hasn't been to university or doesn't know the world of work, this can be very off-putting. So we did a lot of work around that to um, facilitate, you know, employment of, of um, people who may not have gone through education, but also just 
people who may have done it and still don't don't understand this jargon. Um, but there is something I think which is panning across everything, which is focusing on skills. Uh, I think our recruitment processes are sometimes very outdated, and when companies ask me about returners program. I kind of shy away from them because I feel they benefit a very specific small minority of white women who have taken career breaks and coming back to work, and they are very important. But ultimately, I ask them, why can't, can't those women apply through the normal route? Would they be discriminated against through the normal route, or would they not make it? Why is having a break seen as a, as a bad thing? And some of my members actually would say they could completely go through the normal route because we wouldn't even ask about the dates. We would ask about skills and, and we wouldn't ask about experience in the way that it's normally asked for. And I think that's really looking at skills, doing interviews based on skills so that, you know, your education or your experience in the way that we normally see it is not uh, an impediment. Sanjay, you were talking about the challenge in your um, borough of people who... Mm. who our school leavers don't go on to further or higher mm. education. Mm. The, the question yes. raises, poses a similar challenge, but for a different mm. reason, that, that trans people are often disproportionately excluded from education or don't, mm. um, aren't able to access mm. more educational advantage. Mm. Have, have you developed any, um, any strategies for how to help people access work that they may be mm. perfectly capable of doing, but don't mm. have formal... Formal yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, we, we have a big apprenticeship program and with our apprenticeship programs, but making the roles meaningful um, and then allowing them to progress on to other things. Um, and so the council has a big um, apprenticeship program. And we recently actually had a um, university come into our borough, Coventry University, set up a campus in our borough. And what they're doing is um, doing university degrees in a non-traditional way. So they don't have exams. Um, and they do modules one at a time rather than several at a time. And so what they're, what they're doing is reaching out to, to people who, you know, wouldn't think necessarily of going to university, but are attracted by their approach. Um, and again, from a HR perspective, I think, again, a lot of work needs to be done around recruitment and selection. Um, you know, universities particularly love to have, a, um, you know, degree required for every single job and they never really review why that degree is required or if equivalent skills and experience um, would suffice or even if training somebody up that didn't even have everything but training someone up into that role is usually hardly ever considered as well you know somebody not meeting the criteria or the skills but actually in a year's time with training guidance and support being able to do that role and i think we need to do a lot more of that giving people opportunities um, because if we you know, yes, we should look for the best and the brightest, but we need to also give people opportunities that haven't had, um, you know, those those um, opportunities to get their education. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I've got time for one more very quickly because I did say I'd take the lady at the back and then we do need to break for lunch. So if, if you wouldn't mind making it as brief as possible, I'd be very grateful. Thank you. Would you mind standing up? Thank you so much. Hello everyone, good afternoon. Um, my name's Suzanne and good afternoon to the panel. Um, I'm from the Office of National Statistics and I work on the Equality Inclusion team. Um, I'd just like to ask the panel, if they were looking into the future, um, what would one success look like for them? A great question, thank you very much. That's an easy one to answer. Claudia, I'll come to you first. <laughs> very easy. What would success look like? Mm. I think success would, would, would have to be, it would be gradual, it would be slow. I don't see anything that, there are no silver bullets in this conversation that I'm aware of. But I think it's about having, it's through conversations that things will begin to change. Conversations and leadership. If we can engage our leaders in actually making change happen, and all of us who are HR practitioners have the skills and, and the attributes to facilitate that change, then I think we can see a difference in the next, maybe the next generation. But my hope is that the next generation, we, when the next, gen, next generation matures, we're not still having this conversation. But I think it has to start with leaders and having open conversations about the things that need to change. And I do think HR has a critical role to play in making all that happen. 
And given we've been talking about the importance of representation, but it being necessary, not sufficient. If we had a situation, and since the, the lady who asked the question is from the ONS, if we had a situation where statistically uh, women, minorities, people with disabilities were proportionally represented throughout the economy, is that enough? Does that tell us that enough change has happened or are there other questions beyond that about the atmosphere in which they're working or the cultural pressures mm. that they're facing to be in that workplace? And that's where inclusion comes in because what I found both at um, Barkin and Dagenham Council and the university, sometimes you do start to see change in terms of more BME representation, more women, but then it falls back again. So that means that our, our organisation has done some work to get people up the ladder, but not in terms of inclusive practice and them feeling that they can stay in that position. So for me, it would be about representation is very important, um, but I think also um, having an inclusive organisation that actually embraces people and supports people and doesn't put extra expectations on on people of colour or women or whatever group it is once they're there because you know you do hear the phrase that having to work twice or three times as hard and that's still the case now and so people just being able to be themselves people being a allowed to make mistakes just as anybody else does if I, may, I, I do think we need to measure not just representation but also pay attention to the level of inclusion that we get in the workplace as we go forward but I think there is there's a clue, or we're invited to take a leap with it, the way the, the name of our session has been has been structured. I think it's through inclusion that we will get representation, and not the other way around. How do you measure inclusion? You, it, a lot of it has to be qualitative, but I think you can measure it in terms of output. You can, you, it will be demonstrated. You can look at it in terms of length of tenure, would those 52% of the BAME people think that they needed to leave their organization in order to gain career progression? Probably not. Mm -hmm. There are indicators that you can use to take the temperature on where we are and see whether or not it's getting better. Okay. I, guess, uh, I guess for me it's about removing bias from processes and from behaviors and now we can draw on technology to um, create better work uh, work work allocation so that you don't just get work because you're friends with the partner or the senior people in the organization that also helps remove a bias from recruitment and progression that will help everyone not just women or ethnic minority it actually has a, a positive effect across the board and i think positive behaviors we've we've talked about unconscious bias earlier there is a meta-analysis that has been published that shows it is inefficient sometimes counterproductive so at BHC for the next year what we will be looking at is how do we create better training and probably it's not really a training it's more of a discussion facilitate facilitated um, to create positive behaviors and I think framing it as a positive and basically empowering people to have better skills to to be inclusive is where we need to go Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I have a round of applause for my, for my panel? Thank you so much.